Assalamualaikum and a very good morning everyone. Welcome to Razak School of Government's 10th webinar. Today's webinar is called Rethinking Public Health. Before we get started, I would like to go over a few housekeeping items and the structure of our webinar session today. To those who follow this webinar through Zoom, please mute your microphones. We are also broadcasting this webinar live on our Facebook. This webinar session is divided into three segments. First, we will begin with key questions posed to our guest speaker. Then, we will answer questions from participants. At any time during the webinar, you may submit your questions to the guest speaker. Just type your questions in the chat and comment section. Please keep your question short and straightforward. As time allows, we will address as many questions as possible. Lastly, we will then wrap up today's webinar session. This webinar is recorded and you will be able to assess this recording via our Facebook and YouTube page. Without further ado, I would like to introduce our guest speaker. Professor Datuk Dr. Awang Bulgiba Awang Mahmud is presently Professor of Epidemiology at University of Malaya. He is the first Malaysian doctor to gain a PhD in health informatics. Professor Awang Bulgiba is also the first public health physician in Malaysia to hold these four fellowships simultaneously. Fellow of Faculty of Public Health United Kingdom, Fellow of Public Health Medicine Malaysia, Fellow of Academy of Medicine Malaysia, and Fellow of Academy of Science. He is currently Secretary General for the Academy of Sciences Malaysia, Council Member for the Academy of Medicine Malaysia, and President of APACPHKL, a Malaysian NGO dedicated to public health. As University of Malaya Deputy Vice-Chancellor, academic and international from 2015 to 18, he crafted strategies to grow the university's academic reputation and internalization, which contributed to an extraordinary rise in the University of Malaya QS World Rank from 151 in 2015 to 87 in 2018. He was University of Malaya Deputy Vice Chancellor, Research and Innovation from 2015, 2012 to 2015, and oversaw a period of impressive research growth, which saw University of Malaya being firmly established as Malaysia's top research university. He continues to sit on the editorial boards of the Asia Pacific Journal of Public Health and Malaysian Orthopedic Journal and several national and international committees. Professor Awang Bulgiba has published more than 100 peer-reviewed journal articles and continues to be engaged actively in research. He is the lead author for Strengthening Academic Career Pathways and Leadership Development, a book used for the University Transformation Program in Malaysia and is Project Director for Malaysia's National Policy for Science, Technology and Innovation 2021-2030. Datuk Professor Awam Bugibah, let us get started. The first question to the guest speaker, what are the new challenges facing public health? Silakan Datuk. All right, thank you very much for inviting me. Assalamualaikum, very good morning to everyone. Um, I must say uh, that was a very flattering introduction. I'm not sure whether you know I, I can live up to expectations. But uh, let, me, let me just start uh, with uh, uh, a number of things which uh, we probably uh, is quite relevant to public health. Now, when we talk about, there are always buzzwords going around, you know, things like uh, global health, uh, planetary health, which people talk about. But I'm going to be very specific about uh, public health as I see it in, in, in Malaysia and what are the challenges that we face. I think the, the, one of the biggest challenges in public health is, is our image problem. 
it's an image issue in, in public health. What, what exactly is public health? I mean, if you talk to the men in the street or the, or the lady in the street, uh, they don't really understand what public health is all about. And it is only during this COVID-19 pandemic that suddenly everybody uh, uh, is exposed to this term public health. And unfortunately, there are quite a lot of people who are out there who are claiming to be public health experts who are in no way uh, public health experts at all and expressing opinions as though they have been in uh, public health for a long time and as though they, they were trained to, to do this kind of thing. So um, in, in a way, the COVID-19 pandemic has, uh, has done our image some good. In some way, it, there will be some lasting damage from uh, misinformation uh, and, and so on given by these public health experts. So public health is, doesn't have a good uh, image uh, before this. And it was just associated with things like mosquito control, dengue. Every time you see, hear about dengue, then you sort of talk about public health. But in actually, public health is a, is a lot of things. And it's a very multidisciplinary field. This is one field in medicine where it is not just dominated by, by doctors. So we have got public health nurses, we have got uh, health inspectors, we've got public health nutritionists, we have behavioral scientists, we've got uh, a whole host of other things, in addition, of course, to the biostatisticians and the, the epidemiologists. So that's one issue that we have a uh, challenge here in Malaysia. Perhaps elsewhere in the world, it's, it's a little bit different because in, in the US, for example, uh, many clinicians take MPH, a Master of Public Health, because they wish to understand public health better, which will help them in their clinical practice. So that is the first issue. The second issue which, which, which is faced by many countries around the, the, the world is that there's a, there's a great rise in lifestyle diseases, and it is a truly pan, uh, a pandemic in scale. Lifestyle diseases, even the poorer countries are succumbing to this lifestyle diseases. So we have lifestyle diseases becoming very prominent in developed countries and becoming, uh, in addition to infectious disease spread, uh, about a burden also in developing countries and something that which they can ill afford to, to, to have, a double burden of disease. The third one, which I see coming, in Malaysia, we are not really preparing well for it, but in some countries, they have already experienced it. It's, it's, it's an aging population. This is a demographic shift which has occurred um, over the last uh, few decades and is creeping up on us. And we, without us realizing it, it's, it's, uh, it's in 10 years time, I think we'll be classified as an aging nation. So we, we are at the threshold of a big change here, uh, this aging population. And we're, we're really not well prepared for it. And the fourth one, and this is what we are experiencing now, is rapidly spreading infectious diseases. So we have, um, we've had H5N1, you know, the influenza A a couple of times in the last uh, 20 years. We had a very bad outbreak and the first ever outbreak of the Nipah virus in 1999 here in Malaysia. We've had SARS, of course, in 2003, 2004. And of course, now we have COVID-19. We started in China uh, in, in December last year, but basically prominent uh, this year here. So we've got, we've got all these rapidly spreading infectious diseases. And some of these infectious diseases, you know, when I was a medical student, we had never, um, we have only read of this in, in textbooks. So for example, chikugunya. When I was a medical student, chikugunya was just a disease in the textbook of uh, African countries. But now we've got chikugunya here in Malaysia, it's endemic. And the fifth one, which is, um, which is particularly worrying also for me because it ties uh, everything together, is the sustainable healthcare financing. And this is something which is, which is very worrying because it's, it's for the future. It, uh, we are showing signs that the current model that we have here now in, in Malaysia on healthcare financing is, is not a sustainable model. And in many countries, healthcare financing is proving to be unsustainable. So they're finding ways to, to try to, to finance it. In the US, uh, as you know, the uh, ACA, the Affordable Care Act, or, or otherwise known as Obamacare, was introduced just because of this, because sustainable care, healthcare financing was not available. And to, to many Americans, uh, there, there was no uh, healthcare. I was involved in a small part 
in the in the in the in one which was very long ago, ninety six, when I was still in the Ministry of Health. Uh, that was the second National Hemorrhage Survey. It was done like every two, uh, 10 years or so, but now it's practically done every every year, but with different things. So what is clear is that our lifestyle diseases uh, are increasing and the the increase is seems unstoppable. The number of uh, heart disease with patients that we have is forever increasing. The, our diabetes prevalence is uh, well above uh, uh, 10% now, I think it's probably 15 or, or 16% of the adult population having type 2 diabetes, which is really worrying because, you know, diabetes will lead on to a lot of other things, will lead on to heart disease, will lead to strokes, it will lead to uh, uh, gangrene, it will lead to a, a reduced immunity. And in this COVID-19 pandemic, people with uh, diabetes and high blood pressure, basically lifestyle diseases, stand a very very good chance of dying from uh, from COVID-19 compared to, to others. So this life, lifestyle diseases, unfortunately, cannot be tackled by just building more hospitals, more heart centers, uh, more drugs to treat diabetes. It has to be tackled by preventing the start of uh, the disease in the very first place. And that starts right from the womb, not when the child has already grown up. So we've got to prevent it before the child is born. And that means educating mothers, making sure that you don't have low, low birth weight babies and, and so on. Because lifestyle diseases start very, very early on. And social determinants of disease are a very important factor, which determines how, how well uh, you will do on in later, in later life, uh, depending on how, how good your, your social determinants indicator are on and in childhood. Now, the third one, the third challenge, which I was talking about just now was the aging population. Now, how, how do we tackle this aging population? We, um, we don't have a, even an elderly act in Malaysia. Uh, there is one group in my uh, university, which is uh, trying to help the government come up with, uh, with uh, an elderly act, act for the elderly, which looks at how you know, to tackle this aging population, which is creeping up on us. So how do we prepare for this? And the aging population did not necessarily be seen as a burden because the uh, aging population is part of the silver, silver economy, the silver head uh, economy. And it opens up uh, immense possibilities for, for economies and for people who deal with technologies. How do we um, come up with things like uh, assisted living? Uh, how, do we, how do we help? Uh, at least live a long and uh, productive life. So they can be an important part of the economy and important, uh, imp or opens up immense possibilities for, for countries which, are, which have time to prepare for this. Now, the fourth one, rapidly spreading infectious diseases. Our, our response to this particular pandemic, for example, has demonstrated that our, we are actually not very well prepared for rapidly spreading infectious diseases. That's because our response has typically been concentrated on looking at the health rather than the uh, uh, holistic uh, response. And uh, we have not uh, enabled a whole of government or a whole of society response in our pandemic preparedness. So we are now uh, have the opportunity to prepare for another pandemic of this scale. And I am afraid that given climate change and given the, uh, the rise of uh, zoonotic diseases, it is only a matter of time before we see a next uh, pandemic of the scale that we are seeing now in COVID-19. And we've got to be prepared for it in the future. And we've got to better, be better prepared. And uh, the, the last one, uh, un unfortunately, this, the fifth one, the sustainable healthcare financing. So how do we fix that? We've got to find a better model than what we have now. At the moment, our models, uh, uh, healthcare delivery model in Malaysia is split into uh, public and, and private. So we've got um, maybe 40% of the doctors taking care of 40% of, 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 of the, uh, of, well, basically doctors, 50% of the doctors taking care of 80% of the population, while the other 60% uh, in the private sector takes care of only 20% of the population who can afford uh, private health care. So that's not a sustainable model, nor can we 
go on like this uh, for, forever. We keep on building uh, new hospitals, believing that is the solution, but really is that's not the solution. That 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 will just uh, be uh, uh, tackling the, the demand at the at the end scale rather than preventing the uh, the demand. And this demand is not going to reduce. If you look at the US, for example, they spend around eighty percent of eighteen percent of their GDP on healthcare, and they still don't have good healthcare. So, and you know, even the ACA, the Affordable Care Act in the US is only going to address some portions of these uninsured uh, Americans. So we got to think of how we're going to have a sustainable healthcare model, which is applicable to our country. There's no one size fits all as far as healthcare financing is concerned. Social insurance may or may not work here. Tax-based insurance, uh, unless we find a, a good alternative uh, tax uh, uh, base for to, to sustain our healthcare uh, financing is it, not going to be sustainable in the long run. And 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 comments like uh, we should be spending 8% of GDP on healthcare, for example, is is for me rather simplistic. You can't you can't say that just because the, the UK spends uh, nine percent of GDP on healthcare, that is the model to follow. It didn't necessarily be the best model. Okay. It, it's just uh, spending more money on on curative care, uh, for example. So just just my take on on some of the issues and how you would like, you know, how I can see some of the uh, these uh, uh, issues can be can be resolved. I don't have, of course, the solutions right now, and this is a more for discussion later on. Thank you, Dato. Uh, we were out from the the line for about ten minutes just now. Yeah, I know. I, I proceeded to the second part, which is answering <laughs> answering the issues about healthcare. So I think we can go straight to the third question, Dato. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. So the third question is: What can individuals do to help protect and promote public health? Yeah, I think the individual responsibility is to to first and foremost to try to maintain good health, and uh, unfortunately, good health is is just it's related to a lot of things and it's related to a lot of social determinants also, uh, which means that if you are uh, poor, you are already at a disadvantage as far as uh, health is concerned. Now, if you are born in a certain locality, that's why some people say this is like a lottery. You know, If you're, you have the wrong post, postcode, then you will struggle to break out of, uh, of, of this. A very poor social determinants to, to try to get better health. So, so I think the first thing that anyone should do individually is to take responsibility for their own health, not expect somebody else to, to fix their health for them. So they have to um, promote themselves. And they have to be able to, to shift through, to shift through all the uh, huge amount of information out there on health. And uh, we have to give them the tools to be able to uh, analyze which ones, which ones are applicable and which, which are not applicable. So I would advocate that the uh, individual listen to real experts on health rather than uh, pseudo experts. And unfortunately, we have to equip uh, people with how they want to uh, analyze uh, all this information and, and, and extract the, the the correct ones. Right. The third one which they can do is to advocate uh, for good health policies to the individual. So I, I'm, not, I'm not saying that individuals can make uh, much change, but together, collectively, um, NGOs uh, and, and so on, a group of people can advocate for better health policies. And better health policies do not necessarily mean uh, more curative care, not necessarily. The best, um, cheapest way is always uh, preventive care, but preventive care is politically uh, doesn't make good uh, photo opportunities. So it is not uh, easy to promote preventive care because people do not see any results coming out from it immediately. You can't see results in one year, two years, uh, three years, even five years. But if you do preventive, preventive care well, you will see uh, tremendous results in, in 10 years. Just to give an example, for example, uh, in the early years of uh, since independence, one of the things which Malaysia did right was uh, 
in, in public health was actually education of girls, okay? education of women. Uh, better educated uh, women uh, tend to have uh, better spacing in their pregnancies. They have uh, fewer children and they take better care of their families as well as their children. So there's one, in fact, one of the, the, the greatest things that we have. And it, and it is to do with public health. So we have to think of along those lines, even though it's not apparent that uh, education leads to uh, better health. But uh, that's, that's how it is. And it is, is proven right uh, over, over time. So individuals can, can do that, you know, get themselves better educated, uh, break up, get themselves uh, understand that they have to take responsibility for their own health and uh, try to engage in advocacy for better health policies uh, for the country. Right, over to you, Dr. Ismail. Thank, thank you, Dr. Uh, we are now you are open for question and answers from the participant. We have started to receive questions, Dr. Okay. Uh, I read to you questions from Aiza. She right. mentioning about preventive versus curative care. Right. And she hoped that we will put at least equal effort on preventive care. Uh, preventive care effort in Malaysia so far, in opinion, in, in your opinion, Prof, is not enough. No, not enough. Way not enough. If preventive care was enough, then you will not have this obesity problem that we have now. The ob obesity is increasing rapidly and it's in tandem with the increase in, in prevalence of, uh, of type 2 diabetes. Type 2 diabetes basically is non-insulin dependent. It affects adults uh, and it's very much related to weight. So if you were to prevent weight increases, you would reduce, you would reduce this kind of of prevalence of, uh, of type 2 diabetes. But it doesn't make good press. It doesn't make good photo opportunities. So you open a new hospital, it makes a lot of uh, good press politically. So it's good political mileage. But if you say that we, we are starting an obesity prevention program, for example, uh, say, so for what, you know, that, that kind of thing. But it should use that as an opportunity for, for example, if you want to do obesity prevention, we are talking about an industry here. Mm -hmm. We're talking about industry which promotes uh, wellness, which promotes uh, uh, exercise and so on. And there's a whole host of spin-offs that can come out from it, and including, of course, the diagnostics. You know? So um, unfortunately, that's not the case yet in, in, in Malaysia. And then I, I suspect in many parts of the world, that's why obesity is and, and, and diabetes are increasing in many, many parts of the world, including in developing countries, not just developed countries. Uh, we have a follow-up question from that, Dato, from Encik Lau. Uh, sure. The question reads, how would pharma companies react to more emphasis on preventive care? Would this be something which they will advocate to? It depends on what they're marketing. If, if you are... Uh, a company which marketing a lot of diabetic drugs, I don't think you will, you want preventive care. So, because they will reduce demand for your for your diabetic drugs. So the same thing, high blood pressure drugs, you know. And preventive care is, is not just, of course, reducing weight, uh, obesity. It's about reducing stress. So, because stress does lead to uh, greater problems, including mental health problems. So, uh, the that's why I said the, the model must must change. If you, our, we focus... Uh, so much on, on on curative care. No doubt curative care is, will continue to to be in demand because some people will will fall sick no, no matter what you do. They they will fall sick. But uh, healthcare in, in some parts is very much supplier driven. So they want to have the, the drive supply so that hopefully the demand will will increase, which is not correct. You know, we have to drive down the, the demand to have better healthcare. It, Better health, not better healthcare, better health. So, and that will reduce the the, the strain on uh, taxation uh, and, and so on and on on the general uh, public. Dato, uh, you you are the first person to receive PhD in health informatics. So, uh, <laughs> first medical doctor I think in Malaysia to get a PhD in informatics. I, that wasn't that wasn't uh, that wasn't intentional. I, I I've always been interested in IT from uh, from early on uh, and my 
last posting in Ministry of Health before I joined the university was in the Public Health Institute. Right. So uh, what happened was that I got recruited into the IT team and I, I learned a lot, of, a lot of things along the way, including how to configure servers, networks, uh, how to set up uh, websites and, and so on. So I, when I joined the university, after about a year, I was asked to rescue the IT department in the hospital. So after I turned it around, then the, the, the vice chancellor decided to, <laughs> why don't you do a PhD in health formatting? I said, okay, right. you know, that'd be a good idea. Yeah. My question is, Dato, how do you see this data fits into the, the future of public health? Data needs in, in public health, I, I realize it's, it's going to change tremendously. And the type of... Uh, techniques they're going, to, they're going to use for analysis data is already changing. Um, now, I, I did a second master's in applied uh, statistics. That was when I was uh, a, a younger lecturer. I was just starting out in UM. And I decided, why, why don't I do a, a second master's? It was a nighttime course, applied statistics, and it helped me in my teaching. At the time, it, I also, uh, I was doing this double job as an IT manager for the hospital as well as a lecturer's job in UAM. So I realized one thing when I was doing my PhD in health informatics, that a lot of the statistical techniques that, that I learned uh, was going to become obsolete uh, and made redundant by uh, artificial intelligence. Mm -hmm. Because my own PhD was on, on the use of AI in, in, uh, in diagnosis of uh, heart disease. So I realized that and I keep telling my students, yes, we are still teaching you uh, statistics, how to do this test, that test. Uh, but a lot of this is going to become redundant because of AI and they're going to be replaced by AI and they will, they will do a job which is much better than, than what we can do simply because AI is very good at pattern recognition. They, they recognize patterns right away. Mm. You know? So deep learning has, has made... Um, has made uh, traditional uh, statistical techniques uh, obsolete in, in some way. In some way, Not completely obsolete yet uh, because traditionally epidemiologists would like to rely on, on, uh, on things that they can explain. And AI can't explain uh, how it comes to conclusions sometimes. You know? So it, it's very hard to convince people of the conclusions that you come uh, to using AI when you can't explain the process behind it. Uh, that, that's one problem about uh, AI. Yeah. Dato, uh, following on that, how do you see you prepare medical doctors uh, for the future if this is the trend? Okay. Uh, I think an awareness about the uh, health informatics is, is absolutely essential now in the medical curriculum. They must be aware. And it is, it's much easier now with the current generation, simply because they are, many of them are digital natives. They've, they've never known a world without the internet, right. so for example. So they've never known a world without Google, without Wikipedia, uh, without uh, downloading music from Spotify, uh, watching Netflix and that, that kind of thing. So it's easier in a sense. But uh, you have to... Uh, make them aware that AI has certain limitations and AI must not supersede the human judgment because at the end of the day, you are dealing with, uh, with lives. And if you were to let, to, to, to let AI decide certain things, they, they may make decisions which are uh, opposite to ethical principles that we hold dear. So we have to be very careful for how we use AI. Now, in, because AI is very good at pattern recognition, so deep learning can outperform uh, radiologists and pathologists. I mean, I, I'm very sorry to say this to my fellow uh, radiologists and, and, and pathologists, <laughs> but if we, if we look at how AI does uh, in re pattern recognition, they can actually outperform and they do it faster and they do it tirelessly. You can feed them thousands of images and they come back with the, uh, with the results very quickly. So if the if the pattern is uh, very usual, uh, AI is, a, is very good at, and will do it at very high uh, accuracy and very consistently and, and so on. So yes. we have to prepare the people to be aware, uh, which is not too difficult, I think, nowadays. But we have to also uh, 
make people aware of the ethical issues about depending on uh, artificial right. intelligence and so on. Thank you for those, such a frank response, Dato. I, I want to read to you a question from Richard Ng. Uh, you mentioned about the unequal distribution of resources, especially manpower, between the public and private healthcare sector. What right. do you think about our current dictomy healthcare system and what is the best way to move forward? I thought about this about, <laughs> about 20 years ago. Lah. Um, my, my opinion is that we have to somehow think of a hybrid public-private system. Uh, funding possibly might be tax-based. The, 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 that will enable better resources to be devoted to certain things which are of not of interest to private healthcare, for example, but can be made interesting to private healthcare. So, for example, if we're talking about uh, preventive care, uh, public health has always been a responsibility of the government because simply because there, there are no returns in in, in uh, private health care. But that's that's the old thinking. In the new thinking, if you look at the wellness centers and so on, it is big business. So it is of interest to, to the private sector too. So if there are, of course, other things which are, which are of no interest to the private sector. So for example, if you want to manage epidemics or outbreaks, uh, pandemics of this scale, that's government's responsibility. That's, that's not private responsibility, simply because no one has a cloud like government to do, to do this. So private sector cannot manage uh, pandemics, nor no will they maintain expensive uh, labs all the time on standby mm -hmm. to, to uh, diagnose uh, diseases for which, uh, they, which may or may, may not come, or may, not, may not crop up. So I think a hybrid system uh, possibly uh, might work, but how do you make a a, a hybrid system, public private uh, system, which will which will work? Is is uh, something which needs to be debated. Taiwan system is a sort of hybrid uh, public private, so the funding can come from a central source. So if you set up a a tax funded kind of uh, of system, then you say, okay, if you uh, certain diseases are better treated perhaps in the, in the private sector, but there'll be a premium to pay and how do you want to manage that, that kind of payment? So partly tax funded perhaps with co-payment uh, possible, but you have to provide a certain level of care which emphasizes promotive rather than uh, curative. So how do you want to work it out? It's, uh, it's going to be a complex question to answer. Otherwise, the dichotomy that we are facing now, we just get worse. And the the drain from public to private healthcare, of course, is is not going to be stopped simply because uh, private public uh, remuneration systems can never keep up with private. It's impossible. So you have to balance it somehow, and you have to say that what is the responsibility of public, what's the responsibility of uh, private uh, healthcare. Of course, at the moment, uh, as far as medical graduates are concerned, we have a surplus. Huh? We have. Uh, uh, that was a mistake because simply, and this is something which, which many of us pointed out 20 years ago, that by 2005, uh, sorry, by 2015, we'll be producing so many medical graduates, there will be a, a glut. And we had already anticipated this uh, almost uh, about 15 years ago by doing projections on how many medical graduates we will produce. So... I think we will have to reduce that, but our training of uh, specialists have to be stepped up. At the moment, our specialists to to uh, to the public uh, to, to to the population uh, ratio is is poor. We overall doctor to population ratio is is good, but the distribution is not good. So you have areas in uh, Sarawak, Sabah, uh, very poorly served, for example. So this maldistribution is an issue which we know has to be solved in a holistic manner. I've uh, always thought that the healthcare service in the government, the, uh, the pay scale remuneration, including nurses, uh, nurses who are on diploma, have to, has to be decoupled from the JPA, JPA kind of scheme. If you don't decouple it, you cannot make progress because you cannot have a, a fairer, a fairer uh, distribution uh, if you're stuck with this uh, old scheme. That's controversial. And uh, some civil servants will, will will not like me for proposing that, but I think you have to decouple it. If not, I can't, I can't see how, how 
because it's, it's more than just doctors. It's, it's, we are talking about a lot of other healthcare workers here. So dichotomy, how to solve? Possibly think of a hybrid public-private system. The funding model has to change and uh, we have to balance the promotive and, pre, uh, and, and cur creative. So you have to increase the promotive and reduce the, the curative because the allure of having greater curative because of higher returns is, is too much. Uh, and if you don't balance it, then this dichotomy will just uh, get worse. Lah. The, this, this imbalance will just get worse in the future. So I proceed with question from Kairia. Uh, sure. She asks, I think that there are plenty of public health message out there, but it doesn't seem to alter behavior. Is there a way to rethink how the government should approach this? I don't know whether people, people watch uh, TV and I've appeared a few times on, in this pandemic. And I always say that I'm an epidemiologist, okay? But epidemiologists, we deal with numbers, but we don't exactly understand people very well. So, Public health is a very multidisciplinary field. If you want to package something which uh, reaches out and, and the Malaysian public is a very, very diverse public, then it has to, you have to understand uh, what makes people change. So, so you need to have behavioral scientists to do this and you need to have communication experts to package this message. Um, much as uh, I come from the old school where, you know, where, where doctors tell patients uh, you have to do this, you have to do that, and the patients will follow, I recognize that uh, not all patients follow advice. Not, not every patient will be compliant. So those are patients, who, people who are sick, people who are not sick, then you have to understand the behavior even, even better because they can't see the relevance of some, doing something which doesn't seem to affect them directly. So that's why I say we have to engage behavioral scientists in, in trying to understand how people's behavior change and package the message so that it becomes something which they can internalize. Now, that's not easy to do. Talking down to people is not going to work. You know, there, there are reports that uh, in Sabah, for example, now. The, the, one of the, the problems they have in trying to tackle this uh, outbreak in Sabah, and it's very bad in Sabah, is that you can't reach people. There are so many ethnic groups in Sabah. There are large pockets of migrant population who live in fear. You approach the kampung, they will just run away and they will hide. They will not agree to be tested, to be isolated and so on. Simply because they're afraid of being caught, being deported and for some of them, being quarantined means uh, loss of livelihood. So right. you got to understand, what is it that makes people tick? What makes people change? So you can't do that uh, easily without understanding human psychology, human behavior. So like as I keep on telling people, I'm an epidemiologist. I don't, I don't necessarily understand human behavior. You've got to get a better expert than me on that. <laughs> Dato, you mentioned the word behavior. Yeah. What kind of behavior that we need uh, to have a better public help in the future, Dato, among the public? I think the, 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 the awareness about the need for individual responsibility for health is, uh, is paramount for me. If the individual understands that health is not um, the Ministry of Health's responsibility is not the hospital's responsibility. It has to start with himself or herself. If they understand that, they, they're not just aware, they understand it. Uh, if they internalize it, then they will do something and they'll be, uh, they'll be motivated enough to make a change. So why is it that, for example, a smoking cessation clinics, the, the vast majority of patients who attend smoking session clinic, go back to smoking. Okay. So it, it fails. And this is from, coming from one of my PhD students uh, from uh, dissertation uh, years ago. She did that among uh, several smoking session clinics and the vast majority go back to smoking. Why? Why do they make this lasting change? Another student of mine looked at obesity management and found that the vast majority of people who attend, and these are people who are uh, uh, are motivated enough to attend an obesity management, a weight management clinic, but cannot lose weight. Why? 
they've been told by the doctors to attend it because they've got they are morbidly obese. So BMI of uh, 30, 33, 35, and, and so on. They said, if you don't do something, then you, you're going to die within a few years. But they still don't make a lasting change. So why? Why? Very hard for me to explain. My, my simple explanation is that it has not been internalized well enough for motivation to be sustainable. That's my simple explanation. Behavioral experts and scientists will probably disagree with me, but it's okay. That is their field. I don't claim to be a, a better than them in this in this regard. We couldn't agree more with that point at all. In fact, we are facing the same challenges when we train people for them to internalize what they have learned and right. to make it uh, applicable at work. I proceed with another question from Aiza. She said, you mentioned about our aging population and the silver economy potential. How do you think we can start, you can start tapping or venturing into this, maybe for NGO or private sector? Uh, private sector, I think there have been some moves. For example, assisted living communities have been started by, by somebody very, very limited in, in the sense. Um, assisted living, meaning you live in an environment where uh, a lot of things are, uh, you are helped with. And, and that's an economic uh, activity by itself. So, for example, uh, you know, make appointments to see your doctor. Somebody helps you to do that. Uh, somebody checks on you to make sure that you're well every day. Your, your nutrition is taken care of. There, there's physical activity. There are things to stimulate your, your mind so your mental health is taken care of. So, a whole host of things can go into this assisted living. And to support this are things like... Um, uh, motion uh, detection devices, AI, uh, to to spot uh, patterns which uh, uh, of, be, of behavior or, or uh, to do home monitoring um, kind of thing, and uh, a whole host host of devices to to help people walk, for example, to 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 support uh, posture, to support uh, even weightlifting and, and so on. So there's there's a whole the whole sector of an economy. We are talking about a silver economy. The whole sector. But there are a lot of things which have to change also in Malaysia. So for example, um, let's say you've got, a, you've, got a, you've got a property, okay? Now your property may be worth 2 million ringgit. But it's of no use uh, that 2 million ringgit unless you sell that property. But once you sell the property, that it's gone. So how do you monetize that, that asset that you have? And you know that you reach 60, well, maybe you live for 20, 25 years before, uh, you, you die. So how do you then monetize so that you can sustain 25 years of life from that, from that uh, money which is locked up in your fixed asset? So we have no mechanism to do it. So how, how do we do it? Um, in the West, I, I believe the, they've started doing this, this kind of uh, deferred uh, where you, you, you actually monetize your asset. But your asset no longer belongs to you once you monetize that. But you get a ready income for it, and then you can use that income to move into a, a assisted living home and, and and so on. So we don't have that. So our our laws uh, and regulations need to change to cater for that. Because if we don't change that, you're not helping the civil economy to to move forward. So we also need to change our laws is with regards to uh, inheritance, for example. So what? what needs to be um, as part of uh, inheritance law. And this affects uh, Islamic family law also because Islamic family law uh, stipulates that unless there is, there is consensus among the, the heirs to the estate, uh, you will follow this uh, principle of faraid. And uh, principle of faraid would mean that uh, you will not be able to uh, monetize certain assets unless you... you uh, you know, you do that early or allow that uh, part of the law to change to allow for monetization of the assets. So I think a whole host of uh, discussion about how do you want to tackle this silver economy needs to take place. And we should do it now before, before we uh, become a truly aging nation. And, and it's creeping up on us. Like I said, by 2030, more than 10% of our population will be uh, more than 65 years old. So by, by that definition, we will be classified as an aging nation. We don't want to be caught unprepared for it, you know, and uh, 
we I think we still have some time to do it, but we have to do, do it quickly because there's a lot of work to be done. Legally, framework, uh, the, the, the structure, the, the way that we approach uh, and so on. Uh, next question from Azima Dato. My question yeah. is about COVID-19. Guess is the most disruptive event uh, globally as well as local. We are already have the data. We knew mm. to what to expect. Maybe now many countries have already made the shift, rethinking all sorts of moves. What are we at now from Dato? Uh, because it's a pandemic, there's, there's no way Malaysia can, can uh, tackle it alone. And unfortunately, the Malaysian economy is, uh, we, we are a trading nation. Uh, so a large part of our GDP, I think some people say that just about you know, our entire GDP is, is dependent on, on trading. So we can't depend on the domestic economy because our population base is too small. So in other words, we can't isolate ourselves from the rest of the world and expect to to be able to, to sustain our, our standard of living. That's one. Secondly, I think for this pandemic, it has shown up the, the, the responses that we have um, uh, are, are not optimal. Regionally, we don't have a good network of uh, uh, collaboration between countries, even in this region. So regionally in ASEAN, we don't have a good network uh, between governments to have coordinated action. So it's very much piecemeal. There's no multilateral uh, collaboration. It's very much bilateral. Uh, with Singapore, we set up RGL, PCA, whatever it is, but there's, uh, there's bilateral, it's not, it's not multilateral. So we don't have that. I've been involved in discussions with uh, Indonesia, for example, sharing uh, data and how to uh, we can help each other in this pandemic. But this this about it, this, this discussion level. So there's nothing beyond the discussion. So the first one I said that we have to tackle this on a global scale. The second one is that the lack of the regional collaboration. And really when when a pandemic of this scale, when even developed countries are struggling to contain it, they, they will pay no attention to us. So we have to do this on a, on a regional scale. The third one, and I see this, uh, locally, and I'm, I'm going to say this again. Actually, the first wave, second wave that we have, people classify the wave that we're having now as a third wave. Some people, this is a second wave, but it's okay, like we call it a third wave. <laughs> now, during the second wave, in my opinion, we were lucky. We were lucky. Because I cannot attribute uh, the success that we had in the second second wave to to purely the actions that we took because many countries took the same actions and did not come up with the same result. Right. So we were lucky, but we did not make use of that time. Mm. So we squandered that opportunity to prepare for the third wave, which we knew was going to come anyway. Mm. Some people didn't, 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 would probably dismiss me. And I've been saying that we've been, we should have to prepare for the third wave. Probably know you're being an alarmist uh, and so on. Now we have a third wave. So we didn't use the time that we had during the, when the second wave was dying down to prepare for the third wave. So what could we have used the time for? I don't know how many times I've said this on TV. Now. We have to set up a syndromic surveillance system. I would just ignore them. Mm -hmm. Why do we need a syndromic surveillance system? Because it will, it will be proactive we will be able to anticipate waves in advance and tackle those hotspots before they become a wave. Mm. At the moment, our approach is still reactive. Still reactive. Secondly, and I've said this again so many times, you know, after a while, SOP fatigue, pandemic fatigue will set in. So we have not used behavioral experts to understand human behavior and plan for a pandemic which will last two years. Mm. And I suspect this pandemic will be with us until the end of next year, with or without a vaccine. Because even if a vaccine is rushed out, mm -hmm. we don't even know whether it is wholly effective, firstly. Secondly, whether enough supplies of the vaccine will be made available to ensure herd immunity from vaccination. Thirdly, we don't even know whether that herd immunity will last and uh, we can cover uh, most of the population to be able to go back to normal life. 
So we have to be prepared for the long haul. And we have not used that opportunity to study behavior, come up with something which is lasting, which people can accept, internalize and say, okay, this is our way of life now during this COVID and after COVID so that we do not have uh, issues. Now, again, uh, about this, the fourth one, and I hope people <coughs> will listen to me lah, this time around. We've got to come up with a better pandemic preparedness plan. I've reviewed the old plan. It's a 2010 plan. Uh, pandemic. It's, not, it's not good enough. We, we've got to do better than this. We have not been able to mobilize the resources that we have, and we have considerable resources in this country, and we have not prepared for it. What, what is it that we have not prepared? We have, you know, in, in, in ASEAN, among the bigger countries in ASEAN, we are the only country, don't, don't talk about the smaller countries, lah. we are the only ones who have no uh, means to produce vaccines on our own. I said this many years ago when I was the Deputy Vice Chancellor for Research and I tried to initiate this. A transfer of vaccine technology from uh, the US, for example, to Malaysia, so that we can do and we can set up our own vaccines. Uh, setting up a vaccine is not, not as simple as, uh, as, as you think. It does need quite a bit of trans, uh, technology transfer. And, and we, all, we already have vaccines for, for poultry, for animal use, but we don't have any facility which is uh, good enough or any uh, research which is good enough to make vaccines for human use safely. We don't have. So this is something that we, we need to prepare for the future because COVID-19 is not going to be the last pandemic that we're going to have. You're going to have probably some other epidemics. I don't know whether it's the same scale. But. So, and we've got, uh, I think, fourth, is it fourth or fifth? I think for the future, uh, we're going to make our economy more pandemic resilient. It is not pandemic resilient at the moment. There are, there are, there are lots of issues about our our economy, which is showing up. Every time we have an MCO, there's the worry about, about people going out of work, uh, about people not being able to sustain livelihoods and so on. So our pandemic resilience scale is, is not very high. We don't have sufficient food security, uh, medicine security, and, and, and so on. So we don't want social structure to break down because uh, we did not prepare for it. So... Uh, what else can we do? Well, at the moment, uh, the major major part of the problem is in Sabah. I'm afraid that, uh, and I, I appeared in the, I've been cited in newspapers warning about the uh, imminent collapse of the Sabah healthcare system. The window of opportunity for Sabah is closing very rapidly now. We may have to move away from containment to mitigation in Sabah, which will be very sad for the people of Sabah. So if that happens, then uh, very sorry, lah. but it's going to be a real disaster. Dato, uh, we have come to the end of today's session. Would oh, like so to... fast. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so sorry. Yeah. <laughs> Would you like to offer some parting words, Dato? Uh, for, for my fellow uh, public health professionals out there, I think we've got to make ourselves more visible. Lah. This is an opportunity to make ourselves more visible. I, I apart from uh, a, a few of us doing this, uh, there, there are not a lot of us doing this, and we we got to step out our our skills and uh, advocacy for public health. For for the general public, um, my message is still: health actually starts with you. You know, it starts with the individual. So you have to avert uh, ill health as far as possible. There, are, of course. There are, of course, diseases which are unavoidable, things like genetic diseases. And so you, you can't do anything about those or you, that you are born with. Uh, you can't do anything about that. Um, but there are other things which are modifiable you can do about, uh, you can do something about. And you, you, you can do it by, uh, by internalizing the uh, and, and making yourself motivated. So again, um, it's not an easy thing to motivate oneself to lose weight, stop smoking, um, adopt lefty, uh, 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 healthier lifestyles. It's easier said than done. But you got to start with awareness first and then uh, internalize this, the messages so that you, you can avoid all these uh, issues in, in the old age. Even 
even things like uh, osteoarthritis, you know, uh, pain in the knees and all, they are related to weight. Mm. The heavier you are, the, the the faster you wear out your knees and, and so on. You know, it's not it's not the it's not rocket science. It's it's, uh, it's something that you can understand. But people keep on uh, putting off these kinds of things because they, they always think that there's always some time the time to to do this. And we've got to prepare for uh, our old age, an aging population. I'm afraid that. Even though there are, there are some of us uh, who are on pension schemes in the government, for example, we are, we are in government. Uh, but I don't think the pension scheme itself is, is a sustainable scheme, the government pension scheme. And I think, I think many, many people in the JPA also realize this. Uh, it's just that uh, the political will to carry out fundamental change in the pension scheme, for example, is, is not there. And I think for the business leaders out there, the silver economy is an untapped sector of the economy. It's an untapped sector of the economy. Trust me, it is a huge, huge sector. And we prepare for it now, get in a head start by 2030 when maybe 15% of the population is over 65, uh, then you will, you will uh, you know, realize the, the benefits of this silver economy. And there's, there's a lot. You mustn't forget uh, things like uh, climate change and planetary health, of course, but that's the work for for governments to put in in place, uh, you know, regulations and and uh, the thinking to to deal with it. It is beyond the individual's responsibility. But if you will, yes, you have to start with promotive health, taking charge of your own health, thinking of your 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 old age, uh, aging, how you need to do this, and so on. So the business leaders that should capitalize on it. And for the government, I think the regulatory framework for a more sustainable healthcare financing is is uh, is paramount. It's, our success, healthcare financing model is not sustainable. It's going to it's going to crack, you know, and we can see that. Uh, but it need not necessarily crack if we do something about it now, right? Okay. So sorry, sorry, too long. <laughs> <laughs> we would like to thank Professor Datuk Dr. Awang Bugiba for spending time with us today. Datuk kami di RSOG mendoakan Datuk sihat selalu. Ah, insyaAllah. I mean, I think uh, the country so need your guidance. Yeah. The country need your guidance, need your wisdom for many years to come, Datuk. Yeah. Oh, uh, thank you, thank you. We also thank the participant for taking part. We value your views and feedback. We must put on record our apology today, and particularly to our participant that follow us in the Facebook. We have uh, quite a difficulties in the beginning, uh, and we managed to recover after that. Apologize for that shortcoming. Please follow us on social media for future sessions. Till we, till we meet again, take care, stay safe, and thank you. Terima kasih sekali lagi, Datuk. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh.